Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Today, we're here with Jess Del Virginia, founder and principal of Insight Strategy. Insight develops and manages brands, communications, and of course, strategy. Insight is a strategic partner to their clients across all industries. Today, Jess is here to share a bit about her journey and the tips and tricks that she's learned along the way. Thank you so much for listening. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed this. And let's welcome Jess. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. It's a long time coming. Absolutely. Jess and I met when she first started Insight. I had my first company, Level Exchange, for a few years, and our mutual friend, Ben, introduced us. Shout out to Ben. Let's dive in there. What do you remember about when we first connected? (laughs) So I remember Ben telling me that one of his friends from Providence was starting a company and that they needed help with PR and that there wasn't a ton of budget. But I was like, you know what? We can work with that. I just this will be a good side hustle because I was at my last job. I wasn't really happy and I was looking for new jobs. And I figured, you know, this is a side thing. It's a few hours a week and I can just, you know, use this as a side hustle until I find my new thing. And it was interesting because I always say that level exchange was client number one. In reality, it was client number one and a half because About six months earlier, I had taken up kickboxing and my trainer, his classes were really high quality, but they were also very expensive. And I couldn't afford them at the job that I was in and he couldn't afford PR for his business. So we decided to barter for our services. And so I helped him and got him on a few podcasts and he got me in shape and we are still friends today. I counted that as technically client number one, even though Insight didn't exist yet. Level exchange is, I guess, client one and a half because that was the first client under the Insight strategy umbrella. Needless to say, that was a while ago and Insight is still here and still going strong, still standing, which is amazing. We're going three and a half years. That's amazing. Prior to starting Insight, you worked in more traditional PR public relations. Could you share some background with us around what the typical PR world is like? Yeah. So I worked in some really interesting boutique firms before I went off on my own, which kind of informed the way that I do my own business now. My last job before this, we did a lot of events work and a lot of high level strategic work with some really big names and nonprofits. And I learned so much from them. But I also learned about how relationship building is so important in that industry, in this industry. So I remember being, you know, in my early 20s and my boss would say like, can you just email this person at this huge outlet and just tell them that I sent you and it'll be fine. I was like, okay. And I did. And they just respond immediately. And we're like, okay, sounds good. And it just blew my mind because I was so used to, you know, pitching and writing like a very detailed, like really strong pitch to make sure everything was squared away and cross my T's, dot my I's and getting no answers. But just, you know, dropping a name of someone who has really good relationships in the field worked. So that was a really pivotal moment for me where I realized, oh, okay, I need to know people in order to be doing what I'm doing. And over the last three and a half years, I've been very fortunate to um, meet so many incredible people and build those relationships that are, you know, now we're helping each other out. And so when you were at that last firm, a more traditional, quote unquote, solid job, what made you want to branch out and start your own company? Yeah, I I enjoyed it there. Don't get me wrong. But I think towards the end, I was ready for something else. I actually thought I was going to leave PR and I thought that I would go into investor relations because that seemed even more solid and lucrative than regular PR would be. And so I signed up for business school. I started business school in October 2018. And I remember sitting around the room with my colleagues and we were working on a project. We're sitting in Madrid at IE. And I was the youngest one in the program by like 
five to 10 years. <laughs> and we were working on a project and it came to the marketing bit of it and the communications plan. And everybody turned to me and they're like, what do you think? And I was like, what do you mean? What do I think? Like, I'm the youngest one here. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm going to, I'm diverting to you guys. And they're like, you literally do this work in New York for huge companies. You just told us who you work with. Why are you doubting yourself? You're an expert in this. And I was like, oh, oh, I know things. And it, it helped a lot with the imposter syndrome when I was starting out. And from there, you know, having my business school colleagues and my friends and business partners and people that I've worked with in the past all kind of come together to rally around me and help me as I grew this company, I couldn't be more grateful. Were there certain experiences outside of being at IE and having that conversation that really made you realize that you wanted to break out on your own? You know, I had always said that when I turned 30, I would start my own thing. And I guess 30 came a lot quicker than, <laughs> than I anticipated. But I, it had always been in the back of my head. And when the opportunity to work with Level Exchange and then another friend's business a few weeks later and then another friend's business a few weeks after that came about, I figured, you know what? I can do this for six months. Let's see what happens. And worst case, I'm almost done with my business degree. I can always go get a real job, quote unquote, and we'll take it from there. So, you know, it was always an idea there and just the timing was different than I expected, which I'm very grateful for. You know, when the business was a year old, the world went into a global pandemic and it was up to me to keep myself afloat. I couldn't think about what's the big corporation I'm working for going to do to help us. It was just me. And then I had an assistant that I was also like paying. So it was scary, but it made me realize that I can rely on myself and figure out at the end of the day, the bills need to be paid, the ends need to be met, and we got to do it. So you have to go inward and figure it out. And it was a challenge, but fun. Right. Definitely. Going a little bit deeper into that, were there any specific fears when you launched Insight? Or did you look at it more as an experiment of, I'm going to try this for six months and see what happens? It was, it was an experiment. Like... <laughs> I was, it's still an experiment. I wasn't thinking, oh my God, what's going to happen? How am I going to handle this? It was, all right, these are the amount of clients that I have this month. This is the amount of hours that I need to work to fulfill my, my obligation and my promise to them. This is how much is coming in. This is how much I set aside for taxes, this, this, this. And I had that organization aspect where I knew exactly what I could do with the money that was coming in, how I was handling it, what work I had to do. From there, I was like, all right, I can handle this. It'll be fine. And we'll see what we'll see where it goes, right? It was an experiment, but it wasn't a stressful thing. It wasn't like, okay, if I don't do this, you know, the world is gonna end. I knew that I could always go elsewhere if I had to, or, you know, live off savings for a month if I had to. So I'm very fortunate in that aspect because I know a lot of entrepreneurs starting out aren't, but, um, you know, I still had New York city rent. I still had NYU loans at those NYU loans are no joke. Um, so, you know, it was, there was some pressure, but it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of pressure that I expected it to be. So not an exact fear, but my question off of that then would be, is there a certain place where that confidence comes from? Or is it because you're just continuously hanging your toes over the fire? I don't know where I was mentally three and a half years ago where I was just like, yeah, this will be fine. Because I, looking back on it now, I was like, damn, damn, like, how did I do that? But I think there was some confidence in that I knew what I was doing. And like I said, I had a really great support system. And I think working with you and seeing you pull level exchange together from thin air was incredible. <laughs> so I was like, all right, she's doing it. Ben was doing his own thing. We can do this. Like, we're fine. We can handle this. And everybody was able to lean on one another. And I think that was really special and really cool because we we're all so young, but we all had nothing but audacity. So <laughs> it worked. It seems as though throughout your career so far, you've been able to balance the ups, the downs. I know there's been more than a few downs, myself included. 
do you have any advice for people that are on the entrepreneurship path or for those who may want to hop on the road less traveled for when lack of better terms, shit hits the fan? First and foremost, build your network, meet people, talk to people. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who is going to be very, very helpful to you, who you can be very helpful to. That is first and foremost, because I don't do any marketing for my business. It's all word of mouth and talking to people. So that is something that is really, really crucial if you're looking to do your own thing. In terms of taking that leap, I would recommend, like I said, I had probably about a month and a half runway when I started, which is insane looking back on it now, but it worked. Make sure you have like two, three months at least just to kind of give yourself some time and figure out what you're doing. That That's really important. And try to minimize your costs while you're doing it. When I started the company, I was I had moved out of my studio in New York City and I was living in Jersey City and my rent was significantly cheaper. These days, rent is insane in the New York City area. I don't even want to think about it. No matter where you go, it's crazy. So, you know, if you have a roommate or you can find a way to live at home for a few months while you're starting. But if you are living at home or you are living more remotely than you would like to to save on costs, you still have to take that extra step of effort to get out there and meet people and do things because it's very easy to just sit back and be like, oh, well, I'm trying and sending emails. Go work from a cafe and talk to the people next to you. Go join a co-working space. You know, I'm taking this call from The Wing right now, which is a co-working space in New York and they have locations in LA and San Francisco as well. And we're able to, you know, talk to people and they have networking hours and you'll automatically have a, a thing in common with the people around you because you're all part of that community. What do those moments really look like when you're either, you know, crashing on a friend's couch, you're still at your parents' house, or in your case, you were a Holland Tunnel rat for a while, going Jersey into New York City, back and forth, back and forth. What are those moments like? Because I think that's really where the heart of the status quo really begins to sink in. And it starts to eat away at people. And it really starts to get to you when, whether it's your family, your friends, your parents, your relatives, you're going home for the holidays and they're saying, what do you do? And you're saying, well, I started my own company. I did X, Y, and Z and it terrifies them. So how in those moments were you able to continue to keep going? Yeah. I mean, I'm very lucky that my family was very supportive and they're still supportive. But I remember coming coming around family that first Christmas and one of my uncles was so excited. He's like, he was always an entrepreneur his whole life. And he was like, this is so cool. Like working for yourself is the best. I'm so happy that you're doing this. You're going to figure it out. It's going to be fine. And that was really helpful. And I think when I first started, my mom was a little bit skeptical. She was just like, you're, are you okay? Like, are you paying your bills? Are you paying your loans? I was like, yeah. My aunts and uncles are always like, what's going on? Like, what are you doing now? How's it going? You know, they're excited, but it's not easy for them to just say like, oh, my kid does this and they don't know what exactly it is that you do. I'm sure your parents go through that. Mine do. Eventually, they kind of turn that corner. Once you keep yourself afloat and alive for a bit, they're just like, oh, this is really cool. Like, good for them, you know? Sometimes if you're going through a really stressful time, it's setting those boundaries and saying, hey, I'm stressed about this. I do or do not want to talk about X, Y, Z. Respect my boundaries. I'll share with you what I feel like sharing with you. And I think that that is also a really mature way to approach it and not get mad when people ask crying questions, because if it's your family, of course, they're going to cry. So (laughs) you want to set those boundaries early as well. Thank you for sharing that. So on the flip side, when things are good, they're typically really good. So do you have any standout career moments that keep you motivated? There's a few that keep me motivated. I worked on this fundraiser for Ukraine in Brooklyn. And we were able to raise over 15,000 directly to Ukraine and help out the situation over there. And that started with me speaking to a friend, like a a connection from years ago. She reached out to me and was like, hey, one of my friends is doing this fundraiser. Can you help her? And I was like, sure, I can write a press release or do whatever, you know, something simple. And then, and then they were talking about this one. I was like, why aren't we doing a live, because it was a virtual event. I was like, why aren't we doing a live component? They're like, well, 
we don't have time or budget and we can't figure it. Like if you can make it happen, make it happen. And I was like, well, now you challenge me. Now I have to do it. Like, <laughs> fine. So um, I looked around and I was able through serendipity or magic, however it worked, we were able to find a venue completely free of charge. And we had musicians come and perform. We had an art auction. We had candelabras, people that were dressed in these candelabra outfits. We had raffles um, and auctions. And we had food from Veselka. And it was just such a beautiful night and so rewarding. And you know, I pulled it together with the help of my art director and the woman who started this initiative. She helped with like the financial end of things, like dealing with the donations and stuff. But between this tiny team of people that had never worked together before, we were able to pull this thing together and make a difference. And that to me was really, really exciting. Also so exhausting. I ran myself into the ground, got COVID at one point and just completely burned myself out. <laughs> but, but it all worked out okay because we were all so tuned into the whole experience. The other motivator that I still think about and kind of wish I was doing this summer was last summer, I my lease ended in the city and I packed up my stuff and I moved out and I went abroad for the summer. And I went to Spain and Italy for three months and I worked remote. And I had the very best time in the world. I, you saw my Instagram. I was living my best life. And the thing is that I was able to work remote. And that's where the freedom comes in. And moments like that where, all right, I can wake up in the morning on European time, 7 a.m., work till 10. And then I have 10 till 4 to do whatever I want. And then my U.S. clients come online around 4 p.m. Italy time. And then I work until eight or nine, take my phone calls with the US, dinner time's late, enjoy my evening, wake up in the morning and do it all again. And that balance was so good. I was so excited to be doing that because for the same price as a New York City apartment, I was getting nice Airbnbs on the coast in Italy and I got to enjoy myself and live my best life. And my work was never better. My clients were happy. Everyone was thrilled because I was in a I was in a good mood and I was happy. So it really worked out. So that when I think back on like a motivating perk of self-employment, that's one of them. Because, you know, I was still working the US hours, still doing all the work that I had to do. I wonder, how do we get that to become more of the mainstream? Happy people working. Well, I think the t- last two years of people working remote has kind of set the stage for this, right? Even if you're working for a regular company or a company with multinational office locations, you have the chance most of the time to, you know, all right, I'm going to go work in the London office this week, or I'm going to go work in the Madrid office this week. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't know. It depends on your company, but look into those options. It's a long way. We've covered the status quo in terms of the PR world, for the most part, and your professional career. Do you have anything to add, big picture, in terms of the status quo in your life, in general, whether it's from the perspective of being a woman in business, working for yourself? We touched a little bit on the expectations of family, expectations of friends, but is there anything that has been more of that behind-the-scenes struggle that isn't necessarily spoken about more often? I think in the PR industry in general... It's a very female heavy industry, but I remember thinking that when I was younger and being like, oh yeah, I mean, this is like women run this. This is great. And my former manager of mine was like, actually think about all the companies that we know. Directors and managers are women and below are usually women, but the guys at the top are mostly guys. And that shifted the whole thing for me. I was, I was thinking, I was like, oh my God, you're right. That's how it's always been. And there is a way to change it, right? And that's taking that initiative yourself and putting yourself out there and vying for those leadership roles, not letting imposter syndrome get in the way and just having a really good team of people around you, team meaning friends, family support system, not necessarily a team of employees if you're just starting out, but having that perspective and realizing, you know, there is a space for you to break through 
you just have to find where that is and just do it and not letting the fear get to you because yeah, it can be scary, but also it's really nice when you're sitting with, you know, a Campari spritz and your laptop and the Coliseum's 20 yards away and you're on a call and everybody's happy because you're happy. You know, it's, it's taking that time for yourself and finding where you fit the most and how you can be your best self. So what you're pointing out is more of that unfortunate culture that we have right now, where it is very much male dominated, whether it's in PR or business in general. So because you've gone outside of the traditional corporate nine to five path, you've started your own company, you've been able to avoid a little bit of that. Are there any circumstances for better or worse that you've been able to win or where it's worked against you? I don't like to approach things from a matter of like a battle, right? Where you're fighting, you're doing whatever. I've had instances more recently, actually, where I'm working with older men in their 50s, 60s, and they feel entitled to my time in that they're not a client. They're just someone that just happens to be, you know, around for whatever. And we're, we're working on something and just calling in the middle of the day. And I'm like, I can't talk to you right now. Because I have client calls and responsibilities. Do you want to set a time for a call? But they assume because I am a young woman and not a peer of theirs, they have the ability to just call and I'll jump. And that's, that's that. And I don't like that. You know, I don't have to, every second doesn't have to be scheduled, but a quick text, hey, do you have five minutes to chat? Literally all it takes. And then of course, yes, I have time for whoever wants to talk, you know? Are there any specific, whether it's practical and or tactical tips for folks who are listening, whether it's instances like that or just in general while you're navigating? I think a majority of people that listen to this podcast are more folks who are similarly minded, like us who are intentionally going against the grain. And for those who are not intentionally going against the grain, good for you. We're also here to support you too, especially if you're more of the play it safe type. Maybe we'll convince you to come on board. There's this one girl actually on some woman on TikTok, I believe, I don't remember her handle, but she posts videos where it's how to give a professional response to when your boundaries are being overstepped. And it'll be like, I need you online at 6am. And her response is something along the lines of, you know, while I appreciate the urgency behind this matter, my workday starts at nine, I can log on at eight if necessary you know, just to accommodate this one situation, but my working hours don't start at 6am. And something like that, where you're still setting that boundary, but it's professional and it's on record and you can't necessarily say anything against it, right? Because it's, it's not your working hours. But I think setting those things and realizing how much more there is to life than being on top of email every two seconds and figuring out you know, oh God, I need to get this in right now. Yeah, of course you need to get that in by, you know, the end of the day or by the deadline. You don't want to miss deadlines. You want to be professional. You want to get everything done, do it to your best of your ability, not saying to not do that. But you want to make sure that you're, I, I say this often, but make sure you're putting on your oxygen mask first. You're, fir- you're the first one. You take care of yourself and then you can take care of others, right? Because someone needs you to jump on something at 6 a.m., Chances are that's because of their inability to plan and not your inability to be up at 6 a.m. and on your game and doing the best work that you possibly can at 6 a.m., right? Unless you're planning ahead, right? Like you have a, an event at 9 a.m., you have to be up at 6, of course, right? Like that's part of the job. But if it's a random out of the blue thing, when does that fall under your jurisdiction? Probably not immediately. If you have some warning, maybe, but... Are there any tips or tricks or habits that you have that you think really allow you to set yourself up for success? Obviously, you've learned a lot since starting Insight or throughout the course of your whole life. So if there's any tips or tricks that might be helpful to other folks who might be listening, we're always down to hear those. Yeah. Take notes. Take notes and get a planner. So I was the queen of moleskin planners all through college. They were my favorite thing. And then I realized that I like to see the list in order 
And if things change in order of priority, then I would find myself like rewriting the list and spending time on making the list pretty and doing all this stuff just to procrastinate and get past, you know, like, oh, well, it needs to be perfect. And then I designed my own Google Sheet where I can easily move the tasks from line to line. And it's available on all my devices. And when things are done, I mark them green. When I'm, they're in progress, I mark them yellow. When the week is over, I can minimize that list so that I'm only focused on the week at hand. That has been the most productive thing that I have done because I would be like, oh crap, I didn't bring my planner. What did I have to do today, right? All this stuff that could have been an excuse not to get something done or could have been an excuse to just take a minute to not think about it. And now, you know, I pick up my phone and I can just say like, all right, let me see what I have to do on Wednesday before I agree to this meeting. And I'm able to figure out what that is and I can plan day by day. That has been really instrumental in terms of getting stuff done. I think another tool that I've had in terms of building my business is this networking app Lunch Club. I love it. I feel like I've told you about it before. We, I think you're on it also. It is incredible. It's free, which I don't get how it's free. I hope they keep it free, but it definitely should not be free. You say, okay, I'm free Wednesday at five. And they match you with someone else who's free Wednesday at five. And you have a video call and you chat for 45 minutes and it can be about whatever you want. And you can tell the AI that, okay, well, I'm starting a company. I need investors. I only want to talk to investment experts and investors in that realm. And the AI will try to match you as best as possible. And you can upvote, downvote, figure out if you liked a conversation, if you didn't. And over time, it gets really, really smart. So I've gotten new business off of there. I've met some really cool people. I would, I highly recommend it. Lunchclub.ai, I believe. I think that's their website. But yeah, that's been a really great tool. We do ask every guest these two questions. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And on the flip side of that, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? I would say the best piece of advice, it was less of advice rather than um, just like kind of a statement that turned things on their head for me. So when I first started Insight, I would work with one of my friends from a cafe or from, it was like a sushi restaurant cafe and they had a bar and everything. And I finished my work early. I finished work at like three o'clock that day. I didn't have anything else to do. I was like, I was like, Kind of want to kind of want a martini and he's like so order a martini and i was like i can't i'm working he goes you're done with your work and i was like great but i gotta be online he goes it's three o'clock and you're done with your work you can step away from your computer now and my mind was blown i was like what are you kidding me and he goes who's gonna tell you that you can't and it was such a moment of disbelief and excitement. And I was like, you know what? I will have that lychee martini. And it was delicious and lovely. And it tasted so sweet because of the victory of, oh, I don't, I don't have to work past three if I'm done with my work. I wasn't just hanging around an office waiting for five o'clock to hit because my time is more valuable than that. Right. So that was a really poignant moment for me when I first started business. The worst piece of advice, I don't really know if there is necessarily bad advice. Like I've had, I just don't listen to it. Just like, don't pick up the bad vibes. I feel like, I feel like everything's been, everyone's been super helpful. I think you learn a lot from other people's mistakes. So it's less so advice and more observation and being very observant of what's gone wrong for others. I think that's actually one of the best ways to learn about a situation. That's amazing. On that note, thank you for being here. I cannot wait to hear the other, uh, the other guests. I can't wait to hear the other podcasts. It's going to be really good. Very excited for you. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. 
If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.